Hello and welcome. This is the Blood and Pigment podcast. I'm here with Dan. Hi. And Joseph. Hello. And I am Garrett Swader, and we are the Blood and Pigment podcast. Anyway, uh, so Dan, what uh, what have you been up to lately? Um, lately, just we played some Blood and Crowns my last game day. Did some really cool keep scenario, and then I'm in the process of I have a light frigate that I'm converting into a polacra. So I finished the hull. It's all painted. I just got to assemble the mass and jerry-rig a really big latine sail for the front. I am very, very excited. And then I'm just testing and prepping my list for Adepticon. I got some Russian Cossacks for Blood and Valor that I'm getting ready to put on horses. And I've been testing my list for the, the Blood and Plunder Sea Tournament meticulously. And I think it's in a good place. So, uh, did you did you say what faction you were thinking about running for the tournament? I'm not ready to reveal that at this time. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but people who know me probably know exactly what I'm playing. <laughs> well, now I'm just going to look up the registration and spoil it for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> he has this many models. Use this strategy to beat Dan and destroy his credibility. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to, Garrett? I have been working on stuff for Adepticon. I've got a I've got a big Castillo de San Marcos over here to my right that needs to be finished. It's been raining a lot around my house lately, so I've not been able to get outside to like prime stuff that I need to. So hopefully that goes away soon. My tournament list is still kind of up in the air. I think I've settled on a type of list. I just need to settle on like what ship to run right now, and it, one of them could be the Galleon. I'm working on getting mine prepped for painting. You're going to trigger Dan. Yeah, it's a good 80-hour project for a really, really overpowered. <clears throat> Sorry, I coughed there. Ship. Well, uh, yeah, I'm just I, I'm just going to put dudes on it, and I I'm, I'm probably won't even bring artillery. So, <laughs> 39 models. Mm-hmm. Hey, I had to fight a list that had 50 pirates on that stupid galleon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a little less than that, but... So what's what's been going on with you, Joseph? I've been doing a lot of work on the Adepticon too, just getting events set up and planned, and running the painting contest. Blood and Pigment is running a painting contest this uh, winter and spring, so keeping up with entries there. When you're listening to this, the painting contest will still be open. It's running all the way up through April, I think. Got about seventy entries so far. Got a ton of stuff to give away, and it's always fun to share your painting projects and get inspired by others. So. That's been fun. I've been reading history. I just finished a biography of Ned Lowe, which may make an appearance in the next Firelock Blood and Plunder expansion, so that should be fun. Ooh. Yeah. He's kind of a crazy guy. I've heard that. I don't know too much about him. Yeah, most of it's from Charles Johnson, looks like, the information that we have, but yeah, probably be very diagnosable in today's age, but it should make some for some really fun gameplay, kind of a, is he going to be this kind of crazy or that kind of crazy. So it should be fun. Uh, I've been painting some of the new miniatures. We're going to talk about the new miniatures in a little bit here. Um, but I've been painting some Corsarios, which is a lot of fun. New sculpts for Spain. When's the last time Spain got new sculpts? Garrett, you should you should be sensitive to this. That would probably be before I got into the game. They've never had new sculpts since the first Kickstarter. No new sculpts just for Spain. So this is exciting to get some new models. They have Spanish flavor. Casarios look really sexy. I love them. Yeah, I, I like them too. I've not gotten my hands on them yet, but I, it is a top priority. So yeah, if we want to segue into the resin minis, that's that's probably a pretty good pretty good segue right there. So far, like it recently, just in the last what, what three months, two months, uh, started selling three D printed resin miniatures and replacing their metal line metal has been kind of an issue for them last couple of years where metal costs went up a lot were kind of swingy especially during covid and the packs that started out i think as nine dollars in the first kickstarter are eventually up to 24 dollars a pack for a pack of four which is just kind of stiff pill to swallow um yeah i think they were 12 when i started in the game yeah they, they were 12 for a good while but six dollars for a minute jersey is pretty and they're metal i like the metal i like the weight I like the kind of smooth edges that you get with metal. It's a certain charm to it. 
And then they, with the Raise the Black, they did all these hard plastic miniatures. And then they've been working with Siocast for a couple of years now, trying to make it work. And then when they were working with the Siocast, I, this is some background information exclusive behind the scenes that actually probably not. <laughs> they got this really nice 3D printer to make masters for the Siocast. And while they're working with that, they were really impressed with what they were getting. And, and they got a really good recipe or formula for durability. And they move towards selling these 3D printed models. They're super detailed, really crisp. Uh, they're pretty durable. That's the problem with resin. A lot of companies have made resin miniatures that just shatter <laughs> if you look at them sideways, which is no fun. And they're hard to glue and you get droopy swords and stuff. But To your point about them shattering, I, I felt like the North American yeah. Natives release that they did I liked those minis, but they were fragile. Yeah, I was thinking all the way back to Games Workshop Lord of the Rings miniatures that they did in some resin, and they're just, if you drop them, they'll just drop, fall to powder. But yeah, some of the early, uh, earlier Firelock 3D printed ones from the natives, they're pretty fragile too. you got to be careful. But I'm excited about this line. I've bought probably 100 of them already, <laughs> uh, which is kind of silly when I already have metal sitting on the shelf waiting for me to paint. But I'm really excited about them. I think they have a lot of advantages, so I wanted to talk about them a little bit on this episode one. Um, you've got, you're, both of you have got a couple of miniatures so far, not tons of them yet, but what's your impression? I got some Stylecast seconds before, and I'd painted, I, I'd painted them a little bit, and I they paint up fine, but the prep work in them I wasn't super impressed with. Yeah, it's a strange material, soft enough where it doesn't, it's never smooth as soon as you start to goof with it. Yeah, yeah. And so that was that was the thing with those. I was like, eh, this is okay. But once these 3D printed resin ones came in, when I first got them out of the package, I was like, are these 3D printed? I couldn't, I couldn't tell. I was like, I, I was looking for the print lines and I, you can see them sometimes, yeah, we got to be honest. There are some print lines. Uh, just at, if the printer is printing at a certain angle off of a angled edge or something, you can see some print lines. But most of the time, though, on the miniature, you're not yeah. going to be able to find it. In my experience, slap a layer of primer on there. Yeah, especially after painting. Yeah, they're like no other three D print printed materials I've seen so far. Yeah, I've been pretty impressed with it. I have one currently. Um, I have the online exclusive English commander, the dual pistols. He looks real slick. Um, he's primed. I haven't decided on the paint scheme yet, so he's staring at me from my little shelf of stuff that needs to get painted. But I, I took him out of the box. I looked him over real quick. I compared him to my older metal one of the same sculpt, and there's just there's no comparison. The details are so much more pronounced. I just I I love it. I'm a sucker. For a detailed mini the fact that i could see the buckles on his shoes made me very very happy i couldn't see that on the metal model just like a big square blob and this i can see the outline and you can see the tongue where he's buckled it in it's it's fantastic yeah yeah the pistols on a lot some of the metal models they have are holding a pistol out and the pistol's kind of a blob but these these you can see the lock mechanism you can see the little bolt on the other side of the pistol detail is really great the faces all the little beards and mustaches it's so much easier to paint and make look lifelike the detail is really far and away the yeah. best i think it's even better than the hard plastics well the hard plastics are really good too yeah it's comparable um i did a stress test on all the different firelock minis i dropped them from like 30 inches onto a concrete floor <laughs> with a slow-mo camera on them to see how they would do. And uh, on repeated drops, you ended up breaking little bits. The metal miniature, it didn't break anything off, but it put some big dings and uh, textured scrapes. The hard plastic miniature, actually, it was so light, it just bounced every time. Nothing ever broke on that one. <laughs> but the rest of it, it did really well. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm really happy they've already published they've reissued basically all their metal line except for the unaligned at this point the basic kind of sailors and stuff the natives just came out yesterday as of recording this on january 27th they're a little cheaper too 18 dollars a pack of four instead of 24 which is a welcome relief still not super cheap but good 
I have all these medals on my shelf that I've been prizing to paint, but I'm like, I, I like painting these so much. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this metal now. <laughs> I'm really excited for the future of Firelock too, because it seems like they can uh, just be so much more flexible and quick on their feet. They can print up a tray of these a lot easier than they can make a mold and invest the money and all that material to make that for the spin casting metal. They've already made several exclusive minis. They've been giving away with orders. The process is so much, I don't know if it's to say it's simpler because I'm not really doing it, but it seems like they're able to get a lot more done a lot quicker. So I'm excited about what this could do for the future of Firelock. Seems like for a while we had a dearth of new releases and all of a sudden we got all this stuff coming out. So I'm thrilled. Yeah, it may not be simpler but it is definitely it does seem like it's more streamlined it may take a little bit more work but everything seems to be like quicker about it you know yeah i can't wait for you to send me that morgan that you have for me and i'm gonna paint it up the same way as my metal one and put them next to each other and do a good comparison so i get a real good look at them was i saying that to you i, I forgot am I, am I doing that yeah that was that was moi <laughs> I call ye old the art of dibs with an E. A uh, quick side on that. They're they're 3D printing oak and iron ships now, aren't they? I've seen some pictures, and they look pretty great. I would imagine so. Yeah, I'm excited about what they're doing here. Sounds like they're going to phase out their efforts on Siocast and invest in another printer or two so they can increase production on these, and I am all about that. That is awesome. Yeah, once that galley frigate comes out, I'm going to grab one to snag because it'll look really good and I make a little display with it. A couple more experiences I've had with these. Like I said, I've had about uh, almost 100 shipped to me at this point, and only one has been broken in the pack, which I think is a pretty good sample size. How many of them have you had to fix? Depends what you mean by fix. I've been hearing a lot of people complaining about fixing them, but at the same time, I look at them and I'm like, there's really no like prep work to do with these things except for do that. Every so, mi- miniature needs some prep. So if you have a multi-part miniature, you got to cut, cut them out, you got to glue them together, you got to rub all the nubs off. Um, metal miniatures, they're all bent when you get them. You got to straighten them out. You got a little flash you got to cut off. Uh, these have some prep too. Yeah. Um, when they come in the package, often the ankles are bent, maybe one quarter of them. You just need to run under hot tap water straighten out the ankles so the bit they're standing straight on the base and then just turn the tap water on cold and then they're good and i haven't had any return to their weird because they're bent over shape so that's one thing that you really just gotta expect to do and then there are some little nibs and bumps uh when they print them there's all these supports that's how the 3d printer works uh these little strings and stuff that hold the block together and you do have to scrape those off sometimes that's annoying sometimes it's kind of hard but the end result is still better detail and smooth this than many chopped off sprue or metal, metal miniature. I don't know about the detail on a hard plastic, but uh, I'm always kind of lazy and don't file down my sprue you know, connections very well. So I've had good success. Some of them, like this part all I'm looking at right now, he has a lot of little bumps. You just got to scrape off with the flat or sharp side of your hobby knife. So there is a little work. But I would say it's comparable or less than any of the other styles of miniatures they have come out with. So being realistic here, they aren't magic, but they're really great miniatures. Yeah, I wasn't saying that they were like paint ready coming out of the box. I was just saying like in comparison to like the metals and the plastics, you're going to you're going to do about the same or less work with these guys. They've already got some new miniatures out since they've started using this process, too. We got the Corsarios we were talking about earlier. Very fancy. They have a little bit of a musketeer vibe with some fancy capes and fancy hats. They look very Spanish. Their cup hilt rapiers look amazing. And they got a fire lock musket, which is pretty fancy for a Spaniard. We got the Provincials, which is really just a re-release of the soldier model from No Peace Beyond the Line. But instead of having a match lock, they have a fire lock gun. So they're really good for some of the colonial stuff from Fire on the Frontier or Raise the Black. Uh, late 17th century style soldier they have a plug bayonet which that uh original model didn't have and they've been cleaned up and it's a little more sparkly we have the eberville commander which is a new legendary commander that was uh 
Ian, no peace beyond the light and fire on the frontier, but now he has his own scope. That guy is out. You like that guy, don't you? Yeah. Oh, I really like him. Not just for Iberville, but with the launch of the Kickstarter, there is an exclusive plastic um, 18th century commander. and There hasn't been anything for anybody else who's trying to join in and find a generic looking commander for the 18th century. And that Iberville model looks generic enough to where if you want to pay him up as Iberville, you can paint him up as that. Or if you want to make a modern, more 18th century looking red coat commander or something like that, he looks good enough that you could paint him up and nobody would really know the difference. We got the Compagnes Francis de la Marine, however you say it. These are the, Bless you. Yes. <laughs> French professional soldiers that were good at woodland warfare, or they went to the Caribbean too. Kind of their foreign legion, I guess, sort of. Although somebody's probably got to make a case about that. But they have the funny uh, nightcap hats and leggings and stuff. So those have come out recently. And you got a new filibuster model, which is an exclusive they were given out. They've been reissuing some of the exclusives from the original couple kickstarters as well the alternate sculpt of morgan the alternate sculpt of pardal i don't think they've actually released that yet but they accidentally sent went to my game store so i bought it today <laughs> see with the two pistols <laughs> instead of the two swords <laughs> they knew you'd be there i didn't tell the game store it was a special one i just bought it <laughs> so yeah they seem to just be able to release new stuff at a, a rate that has been unimaginable with metals or Sayocas, which is super fun for a big Thunder fan. Yeah, I think they're I think they're also going to update freebooters. Yeah, they're actually doing a whole new line of freebooters. I've seen those sculpts; they look pretty good. There's a guy kind of yelling; it looks pretty cool. The other thing that this allows is more dynamic pose, more three dimensional poses that take up kind of more space. The Sayocas, especially, they kind of needed them flat <laughs> because you have these yeah. two sides coming together same thing with the metals but with a 3d printer you aren't limited that way there's other limits for every every method has a limit but you're able to uh, even some of the like the marineros that guy with the pot belly and the no shirt <laughs> the drawing of him he's so dynamic but the metal miniature is a little less so but they've gone through and tweaked all these masters and the 3d printed one he just He's man spreading. He just takes up more space. He does. <laughs> looks cool. Yeah. That's, that's really fun. Nice. Well, speaking of new things, I have information that uh, we have a new ship on the horizon. And I think if you've if you've kept up with Blood and Plunder news any at all in the last year or two, you probably know what the ship is. It's been threatened for a long time. There's a lot of people that have been. Uh, expecting it to come out for a while now but that is the barcolong and i think i'm saying that right google says barcolongo well google's always right barcolongo <laughs> <laughs> joseph you want to kind of go through a couple of things on this ship i don't know how much you had or you were involved with uh developing this or if this was just like a a mic project but I've seen it in various iterations and thrown some input in, but not a ton. The Barco, Barco Luengo, Barcalonga, we've been calling it kind of a Spanish flavored bark, except good. <laughs> so it's a small boat, size two. It's not a lot bigger than a bark, um, which is the smallest two deck ship in the game right now, but it's a little uh, spicier. Let's see. Here's some stats. If that helps, it's, um, probably around 12 points and it's the top speed of four with a windward minus two. So it's, it's kind of a fishing boat. It's kind of a, just a lame little boat, but the exciting thing about it is it has chasers in the front and they can be medium guns. So this can pack a big punch right out of its nose. It can take two uh, pairs of light guns. It is lightly built. So it's broadside is rather unimpressive. I can't imagine taking those light guns most of the time <laughs> in a in a competitive sense with this ship. So that's the spiciest thing about it. I I think one of the spicy things about it is the galley four. Oh yeah, that's true. So the galley four that means you can row it up to four inches, or you can have your sails set and kind of use sails or uh, rowing. Um, that's one of the big things about this. It has the little docks for your oars along the side and it was punted around with uh, sweeps it's wind what's that yeah exactly 
<laughs> Corsarios and 18th century guard costas. Yeah, it's pretty clumsy under sail, but if you put a crew on the switch, it's going to be pretty fun. And since it has that four, uh, you could sweep it up to five, but it has a top speed of four, so you might not be able to really do that. Well, just keep your sails reefed. You can't take a critical hit on your rigging if your sails are at zero. Mm, yeah, you can. but uh, You can? It's not going to hurt you, though. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, medium gunboat can take medium guns as forward chasers. That's super unusual. Shallow draft and a uh, draft of five, so it's just not going to hit the bottom. Simple rig, that means it's easy to mess with those sails if you're going to. Lightly built is not good because you're going to get uh, light cover instead of heavy cover, but you can buy reinforceable kids, of course. It has four integrity and four fortitude, so it's a matchbox again. But yeah. That's what you expect at a small level like this. I think this will be really great for like the Corsarios if you want to mess with cannons without investing your whole crew in it. These two forward chasers uh, makes you dangerous and you can kind of point at whatever where you want without having to buy pairs that you only can use half of. So I think it's going to be really fun. It has two swivels in front, two swivels, uh, four swivels in back. So yeah, that was a that was a question I had. So chasers, you buy both so for two mediums, it would be 14 points, essentially. You buy two seven-point seven, seven point medium cannons. Nope, it's still a pair. Oh, it's mm -hmm. still a pair? Okay, okay. Yep. Okay, I wasn't sure about that. But you get so, to fire okay. both of them in the same direction. At the same time. That makes them feel more valuable. That's, yeah, uh, well, I mean, it is. Yeah, I Especially if you load them a grape shot. Uh, the crazy, the weird thing about chasers is you got to be careful, right, Dan, that you don't get raked when you're using them. <laughs> I was going to say, watch out for the rake when you're, yeah. when you're pointing these guns at, at big broadsides. You want to come up behind or in the front of people. I was trying to figure out if my dice hate me or the strat's bad, so take this with a grain of salt. Every time I've tried to use chasers, I get raked. Every time that I've tried to use grape shot, I roll terribly. So I generally <laughs> do not employ those tactics. But on paper... I can really see this thing loading up with some medium guns, getting real close and dropping some grape shot right before you're boarding, especially with the five inch move with the Spanish Corsairs. <laughs> yeah, if you assign the same unit to the two swivels and the two mediums with grape shot, uh, what do you got there? You got eight grape shot guns hitting on four plus range, and you got six swivel dice hitting at six plus range. That could be a nasty little punch. That's 14 dice pointed at a deck. Mm -hmm. That's going to hurt. There's a lot of dice coming from one deck. You do have a narrow range of fire with the chasers because you just have the width of your ship, basically. But you can point it wherever you want, especially if you're using those sweeps. Mm -hmm. It is kind of weird. It's a two-deck ship, but it has kind of this... looks like a fighting platform, kind of like the wooden Corvette. It looks like a three-deck ship, ship almost, but the front little deck is just really super small. Your <laughs> mediums fit there, and then maybe like two models. So it looks like it's a subsection, but God forbid we have another subsection. So it's just part of the deck. So it's a little bit confusing to the when you first look at it. But it's one big main deck and a smaller rear deck. Just more of a modeling choice for it, not a not a gameplay choice. Yeah. If I may, uh, my take on this, it's a very aggressive 4-4 ship, especially for those looking to compete with the plastic sloops. The plastic sloops are pretty good for what they are. This is right in that same kind of point range, and those medium guns will deal a lot of damage to those really light ships. They are nasty, especially with hot dice. While I consider the Corvette the quote-unquote king of the 4-4 ships because it can hold up to eight medium guns, and then it's got the same configuration, four souls in the back, two in the front, this will definitely shake up gameplays having big chasers, and normally the only ships that can take big chasers is actually the Galleon, because it can take heavy chasers. That's true. Though. Everything else is light, even on the light, even on the six rate. Everything has to be light chasers, but the Galleon was the only ship that can take big boy chasers, and this can take medium boy chasers. Yeah, that's cool. The other interesting thing I see here, especially compared to the plastic sloops that everybody's playing right now, the plastic sloops really shook up everything because they can take eight swivels, which is crazy for a small ship. And it's kind of made swivels dominant in a new way. This, you got those chasers, but your swivels are a little less impactful. You got two in the front, which is good. And you got four in the back, but the back deck is quite small. And you have your possible light cannons and your four swivels back there. 
So you aren't really going to be able to fit enough men to man all those things. You're going to have to make some hard choices about what you actually buy for artillery and what you man, which I think is good. Yeah. I feel like you take the light guns to just add grape, and then when you're pulling alongside, you drop the light, the light with grape, and then all four swivels as well. I think this is going to be a devastating boarding craft if played correctly. Because, yeah, you know, you don't have enough to reload at all, but I think you're only going to fire those light guns once <laughs> before you hop over and board. Yeah, I think it would be some real interesting decisions putting this in a force and what you bring and what you choose not to bring. So I'm excited about seeing it. I haven't got my hand on a copy of it yet, but it, I've seen the card and it's going to print and they got their mold created and correct and created again. And I think we'll be seeing it real soon here. Yeah, because 12 guys will man basically all those guns back there if you're only firing one side at a time with the with the white guns so you can you, you should be able to fit enough dudes back there but yeah this is this is great i'm i'm really excited for it i like new ships as soon as it drops out i'll be snagging one and if it comes out before adepticon i may be bringing one for the giggles yeah sure seems fun and we should wrap it up there and then come back in another in a, after a quick break and look at a new uh, the 17th versus 18th century pirates so yeah, another thing that we're going to want to do on this episode is we've got some uh, faction compare and contrast, a couple of pirate factions. Dan wanted to do 17th century Brethren of the Coast and compare those to the 18th century Golden Age pirates. So I'll let him take it away. Sounds good. So these factions are very near and dear to my heart. I'm primarily a pirate player. So I played the bejesus out of the Brother in the Coast, and then before Race the Black came out, Mike had sent me some playtest materials for the Golden Age Pirates, so I kind of got to see them become what they eventually did become. And I love them both, but it does represent kind of a weird mix-up. The 17th century Brother in the Coast, these were elite seafaring raiders. They were excellent in their martial abilities. They were known for being the baddest guys in the Caribbean, all under one banner. They sacked cities and ships and made really good money. These guys weren't just, you know, taking little unarmed fishing boats. They were known for sacking cities, sacking unnamed numbers of ships, and would attract the most ruthless commanders to their fold. And they actually did pretty well against professional naval forces. A 17th century buccaneer by the name of Lorho de Graff and his one frigate squared off against two larger ships from the Armada de Barlavento and came out pretty favorably, which is not something that the 18th century guys can kind of say anything to. So they're separated by about 60 years of history. And the 18th century pirates are a little different. They're essentially they're very angry merchant sailors. They usually grew up in the merchant service. They could have been privateers during Queen Anne's War, but they lacked the martial prowess that the previous generation did. They just never got up to quite that level. They typically picked off, you know, really small, weak opponents, which you want to do as a pirate, but it didn't exactly give them a lot of practice for anything professional. And they make up for this, however, with a pretty heavy armament with braces of pistols. Most sailors in 17th century were carrying around a single sword and a single pistol. These guys would pack as many as they could carry on them if possible, but they could not compete with professional naval forces. Is there anything you'd like to add, Joseph, our keeper of the historical records on your bookshelf? <laughs> it is funny how much they change between the mid to late 17th and the early 18th century. Uh, just their motivations are different, although, honestly, that might be pretty similar. Their motivations was to get rich, but uh, it's a different kind of get rich. There's definitely uh, some respect of national parameters. They were eager to attack the Spanish, and the Spanish were pretty easy pickings, honestly, in that 17th century, well, the 18th century. Uh, there's less coordination, even with Nassau. Uh, there's not any big pirate armies of 1,200 men or <laughs> 800 no. men um, yeah. marching across the uh, overland to take a, a, a surprise cities and loot them. It's just a different world. The, I think the big thing probably is the lack of support. Because um, the Brethren of the Coast, they were, they were kind of semi-supported by a lot of these nations that were not Spain. People like Henry Morgan would go to the Brethren of the Coast and say, hey, I'm going to go raid Panama. Who's in it? They went, hell yeah, we're down. How do we play? Yeah, yeah, definitely more <laughs> yeah. coordination between 
even like Admiral Mings, he was a part of the English Navy, but he brought together all these different factions, all these buccaneers who've been just hunting pigs and <laughs> raiding the Spanish and these defunct soldiers in Jamaica and uh, elements of the British Navy and able to combine the, I guess, woodcraft, the uh, good use of terrain and mobility with the discipline of soldiers and just do something pretty remarkable. And superior marksmanship too. Yeah, more familiarity and uh, comfortable use of weapons and willingness to fight rather than just try to intimidate. Right. Yeah, I guess what I was what I was saying my previous point is uh it was more of a socially accepted way of doing things. Yes. Yeah, I mean you saw that with the English. They really shot themselves in the foot because right at the end of the 17th century, they really doubled down on pirate hunting and then when they needed a privateer navy, there was none to be found because they all said, "Well, y'all don't like us, if you want to hang us, we're going to go to France." French still like us. <laughs> the Dutch still like us. <laughs> Yeah, Henry Morgan was able to do some pretty crazy things against Spain while England was at peace and still <laughs> not get really prosecuted by England. And he got knighted, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, eventually, yeah. <laughs> he got a promotion. <laughs> so how does that look in Blood and Thunder? So for game comparison, just looking at their base units, all the standard sailors are good. They're all the standard four points across the board. They got the same equipment. They all have their national flavors. So the Spanish have Ruthless which will give them a minus one if an opponent has more fatigue than them when they shoot them or charge them. The Marins are really suicidal and have crap saves where they hit really hard when they charge. And the English and Dutch are really similar. They're really good at cannonry. The Dutch are a little bit better at boarding, but they're all good for what they are. You know, they're four points. They got good resolve, good stats. And if you put them on a ship, they are right at home. And they have a fantastic unit variety because they're pulling from the French, English, Dutch. And then I believe the only Spanish unit is the Marineros. But even some natives, they have a great unit variety. So there's more kind of things to pick from when you're building your force. So this is the Brethren of the Coast, right? Yes, Brethren of the Coast, cover, covering that first. Found in their best form in No Peace Beyond the Line. They're in the core rule book, but No Peace Beyond the Line expands them, gives them more options because you include the Dutch and the natives and whatnot. Yes, exactly. And for fighting at sea, there's typically three mainstream strategies. There's boarding, there's cannons, and there's boats. And they can do all three of those pretty damn well. I mean, you can build the list for that great. They have good. They have a good faction rule for a plus two to be the attacker, so they're aggressive. And while some of their units are expensive, they have great resolve, and the stats are pretty good. You can make a generalist list, and you have specialized units that you can use. This can be my boarding party. These guys are on cannons. And then the ability to go up and down an experience point in your core units is also really nice for kind of shaking up points. If you really want those filibusters, but you can't quite afford the six-point model, chop them down to inexperience. You got five-point filibusters. They'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, the filibusters and the freebooter unit class are kind of the more professional soldier that has that long rifle and knows how to use it, long gun that knows how to use it. And they cost six points, so that's pretty expensive compared to the three- or four-point models you might be padding out the rest of your list with. But that's kind of where Blood and Plunder started, is these buccaneers, uh, the freebooters and filibusters, and this Brethren of the Coast, or buccaneer factions. Is there anything you'd like to add, Garrett, for the Brethren of the Coast? I just really like the ability to move the experience level up and down. Like that's That, that gives you a lot of flexibility with list building, and it's super helpful. And they have enough unit variety where you can just make one unit inexperienced and get that savings you need without like having to reduce the or increase the experience for all your units. They have so many units you can. That's really flexible and fun. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. And the fact that they have good muskets in their list, which I feel like is a lacking part of the 18th century pirates. Yeah. Uh, I know everybody's yeah. cheaper in there, but there's not a, there's not a super good musket in that in that list and so that really hurts them on land i feel like yeah that's another thing is that the brethren of the coast you can play them on land or at sea and there's not a lot of loss of effectiveness i mean you might struggle with some of the more modern soldiers from the race of black but for the most part i think they're still very relevant on sea and at land i love them um i cannot praise them enough 
And then when we get into the 18th century pirates, like Garrett said, they're kind of lacking. The three-point pirates are kind of meh. They got crap fight, crap shoot, crap saves at sevens across the board, but they do have brace of pistols. So they have poor stats, but are very good on equipment. Brace of pistols, even at 7-7, seven, seven, it's very swingy. And if you start getting into fighting men and your commanders are cold-blooded and you'll play with the rules a bit, you can make them more effective. The roundsmen are very good. They're the six-point elite sailor model for the 18th century pirates. But they're just they're still a far cry from the professionalism of the 17th century. They have similar unique variety, but they're not quite as great as their 17th century predecessors. So when you're talking about the 18th century factions, that specifically is the Golden Age Pirates, which is kind of a catch-all for all pirate crews of this early 18th century. And then we have the Flying Gang, which is a little bit of a variation on that. Those are the main two ones, right? Oh, yeah, those are the main two. I'm sticking with Golden Age Pirates because the Flying Gang has a limitation of only size two ships. So it wasn't really a fair comparison for Brother in the Coast because <laughs> you can put Brother in the Coast on a light frigate. <laughs> Golden Age and Brother in the Coast. Okay. Yeah, so factions for factions, it's the Golden Age Pirates versus the Brother in the Coast, what we're talking right now. So he had this pirate unit really shook the game up, in my opinion, the three point model. So, so far, the only three-point models before that were the inexperienced militia. They have a bad shoot, and they have bad resolve, and they have a musket, firelock or matchlock, and inexperienced. Now we got a pirate with the same resolve, some of the same stats. Some are better, some are worse. Um, with either a brace of pistols, so unlimited pistols, never unloaded, or they can exchange that for a buccaneer gun. Uh, for three points, that's pretty good. They're trained. Trained is the big thing. There. Yeah, trained mm-hmm. model with for three points with weapons. That's pretty remarkable. Their stats aren't the best. Like you said, seven, 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 seven with a six resolve. So they aren't really great at anything. <laughs> but they don't have an eight save. Militias have an eight save. That six resolve is really swingy. Sometimes you'll save it all off. Sometimes a unit will never drop that fatigue during the entirety of the game. It really, it's super swingy. <laughs> it's only as swingy as dice are, so... <laughs> it's a 50-50 shot, so... <laughs> it's a dice game, people. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but where they really kind of start to peter off is their... Great at boarding, and if you grab some, they have access to all the sailor models as well. The same brother in the coast, they have access to the Zelaiden, the Sea Dogs, the Marineros, and the Marins. They have access to them, but you're really going to want to run the three point pirates because they got brace of pistols. But even if you don't run all of them, they're still good at cannons. They can do boat swarms, but the faction rules can really hamper the effectiveness. They don't have a bonus to the attack. And if you're the defender, in a scenario, you have to roll and see if you're drunk. And if you are rolling for a musket list and you got a lot of your musket units are drunk, their shoot is now an eight. <laughs> Which is epically bad. <laughs> Which yeah. is terrible. They're just they're shooting the guns for the noise at that point because they like the noise that it makes. Yeah, that's a big difference. The brother of the coast knew when to drink and when to not drink. More or less when the pirates, they would drink if they had it. <laughs> mm-hmm. While they do get the false colors rule, so I will give the, the Golden Age Pirates that, where you basically can fly false colors if you're the attacker, and you have to roll a 7-up to make that go away, which allow you to close the distance a little bit. But if you're the defender, and again, you have no attack bonus, you got to see if you're drunk. If you're a boarding list, and you're the defender, and you're in like boats, you'll be fine. If you can get there, your fight now dropped to a 6 of brace of pistols, and that is pretty damn good. But if you're kitted out for a musket list especially on land, and you're the defender, your whole strategy might go out the window. <laughs> pirates, the Golden Age Pirates is really not a good musket list. <laughs> Don't do it. Unless you're on land, you bring as many three-point models of muskets as you can. You just want rate of fire or weight of fire and just have all your muskets shoot one unit. You know, you'll probably score some hits. You know, that's what you do with militia is you bring as many as you can to layer up and support. But they don't have drilled, so they don't have any way of reducing that down to slightly better shooting. And it will just, they won't hit anything. (laughs) Just play the flying gang, get ruthless, this helps. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the flying gang is better for that. Um, Flying gang is pretty much golden age except better, so. Yeah, it's the competitive pirates list. 
Yeah, the only real downside of the Flying Gang is that you're stuck with size 2 ships, so if you wanted to run a light frigate, you can't really do that. The Brigantine as well, but if you like your plastic sloops and your boats and you're really confident in that, you can run that no problem with the Flying Gang. But that also brings up the really good thing about the Three Point Pirates. They're hoardable. So if you have a, if you have a galleon and you want to put 50 pirates on a galleon, you can do that with the Golden Age Pirates. Yeah, you can do a remarkable number. I've seen uh, games played where you just have a ton of these pirates. You just sail straight at the enemy. They shoot them, and they shoot them, and they kill a bunch of them, and then they board, and there's still a bunch of them, and they win. I have a six-rate frigate list that's got like 62 pirates on them, and they just stay prone until it's time to board. <laughs> they will kill some, and it will hurt a little bit, but because you got 60 models, strike points are going to be hard for you to, to gain <laughs> on casualties alone. And once you close, the sheer weight of numbers, I've had a group of pirates run over and get repelled, but that unit took a fatigue to shoot. And then I've had another unit be charged over via command point, and they were repelled, but now that unit's at two fatigue, and now they have a third unit of 12 pirates that are now charging over in the same activation. <laughs> so you can just, you know, bring more bodies and your opponent has musket balls. <laughs> so if you were playing for a... Which one do you think is more competitive, Brethren of the Coast or Golden Age? And I'm going to call you on this if you answer it wrong, because I'm looking at your tournament list right now. So. <laughs> um, so I am bringing the Flying Gang because I think they are more competitive, mainly because I like to have a lot of models on my boat. I'm bringing a particularly fragile ship, so I wanted to have as many guys on there. So when I eventually get there, if I choose to board or if I shoot with cannons, I have enough models to support a boarding action or if I am boarded by boats. I love the Brethren in the Coast, but the three-point pirate is really hard to turn down if you need guys to man swivels and charge over. He's so terrible, but he's so tempting. It's so hard to not play him. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. yeah. It's, I, I think the Brethren of the Coast are the superior faction table-wise, but they're not as competitive because, again, the three-point pirate really shook things up. We went from doing games of 25 models to most of our games now have 30, 36 models standard for sea games now between the guys in my group. <laughs> it jumped the moment we got our hands on the book. What do you think, Garrett? Bodies in this game are big. I know Brethren of the Coast are a little bit more of an elite list. They still die on a seven just like the pirates do. So, you know. Most most of them do. It hurts every time you lose a guy. Yeah. Yeah, and you're paying more for it. So just from a competitive standpoint, I think pirates are a little more competitive in the environment we have right now. Especially the Jamaican privateers and the flying gang list. Those are a steal if you drop them down to three points because you got a unit with a musket and a sidearm pistol and resolve five. So you can actually reliably knock that fatigue off them. And if you stick your commander with the Jamaican privateers, they're essentially trained, even though they're inexperienced. You got a command point to throw at them regardless. It's a good unit. I like that unit. And they got a 6-6 six, six for fight, which is great, especially with the sidearm pistol. <laughs> yeah, it's a strong unit. One more thing we haven't talked about is commander availability. Both forces have a good number of commanders. What's your, been your experience when picking commanders for these two lists? So for competitive lists, I tend not to venture beyond the 10-point standard. For me, even 20 points is too much to spend in a 200-point list. I need bodies and I need command points. The 10-pointer is good. If I'm doing casual lists, I like the variety that everything brings. Again, I'm a, I'm a Blackbeard stan. Edward Teach got me into Pirates, and I absolutely love him on the tabletop. So this year I'll bring in a competitive list. Next year I go to Adepticon, I'll probably end up bringing in an Edward Teach list just for the, the shiggles. But they got a lot of really cool characters, and I would argue the Brethren of the Coast also have a lot of fun characters as well. <laughs> yeah, the Golden Age Pirates have all the big names, Blackbeard, Vane, Bonnet, Rackham, Naboos, Roberts, Bellamy, Black Caesar, Hornicle, Jennings, some offbeat guys, Louis Calco Guitar. Calico Jack, if you shake him, fortune falls out of him. That's right. John James, John Quilt, she's her kind of less well-known guys but are all pretty good and for the brethren of the coast we got mon bars the exterminator he's fun henry morgan diego william kidd bartholomew sharp probably more variety actually with the golden age pirates that's interesting and definitely cheaper commanders with the golden age the golden age definitely has more 
competitive options for the for the commander if you want a named guy that you know who he is. And gold, both Golden Age Pirates and the Flying Gang are the only factions that have access to the only, as of right now, unique named female specific models being and Bonnie and Mary Reed. I know there is models for the civilians and the some of the characters, but other minis can take that place. And Bonnie and Mary Reed have their own minis, have their own sculpts specifically to them, which I also think is really cool because they also kick a lot of ass when you bring them with Jack. Yeah, that makes your pirate crew pretty good. Jack Rackham is not very good, but he's super cheap, so he's actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, you don't bring you bring Jack to basically kind of have Anne shake him down to get more fortune. That's about it. She turns him upside down and shakes him like he's she's getting his milk money out of him, and he drops. Come fortune. on, there's one more coin in there. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> always, always one more. <laughs> yeah, both really fun options. I know that we'll see some more options for Brethren of the Coast come out in the future that might make them a little more competitive, kind of double down on some of their strengths um, and make them uh, hold up against the pirate swarms, possibly. I think a more experienced player playing better than the coast has a really good shot against a newer player playing the Golden Age Pirates. But if the roles are reversed, I think that the Golden Age Pirates, you know, are obviously I'm playing the Flying Gang, which is not a faction that I was trying to directly compare here. But they are competitive. And even if you play Golden Age Pirates, you can make a pretty good artillery list if you know you're going to be the defender. Make your opponent come to you. If you're running cannons and you don't have to sail up wind, you can stay down wind and shoot. The Golden Age Pirates are a blunt instrument. Pretty easy to use. Uh, they can fail. If you get fatigued out, You can. it's pretty sad to see your whole boat just flounder. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. the mm -hmm. uh, Brethren of the Coast are a finely crafted and well-kept, hopefully, buccaneer gun. If you don't know what you're doing with it, you might not get much done. Yeah. The moral of the story, just don't run muskets with pirates. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Play better than the coast. You'll have less guys, but you'll actually hit what you're shooting at. <laughs> right. At least you want to be really mean and bring as many Kanoas as you can and <laughs> as many Piraguas as you can. Just load them with as many guys with muskets and just sit back and unload 60 musket shots into a deck. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Eight swivels, that's cute. <laughs> Garrett, what's your been experience with these two? Have you played a lot of them or played mostly against them in Spanish or what do you I've played against them some. I've list built some, but I've not really gotten them onto the table that much. Uh, I've played against them a little bit. But yeah, I think my my impression is is pirates you just want to hoard. That's that's what they're there for. You you, you want you want those models everywhere and then Brethren of the Coast, you want uh, your elite guys that that are going to have meaningful turns when when they come up. You want them to do do a lot when you when you activate them. So, got to get a lot done. Yeah, got to get a lot done for a fewer amount of models. So, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if an errata was made at some point. I'm not saying it's in the works that bumped them up to four points. I wouldn't be surprised. But for what they are right now, it's a really good three-point model for what it is. <laughs> it's a really bad three-point model. It's really good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. But when you have a lot of them, they're pretty good. <laughs> you can actually man an entire Bermuda sloop, not Bermuda sloop, but Belandra, with all the light cannons and all the swivels for 200 points with these guys. <laughs> I'm interested to see how many of these show up at the Adepticon tournament. Um, I think they might be pretty popular a year after, about a year after the, the book came out. So we'll see. I think this is what people are were waiting for, was for the big names and the, you know, these are the Golden Age Pirates. Are the, when you think pirate, they're the, that's kind of what comes to mind, are these guys. Yeah. Which is really funny because they're the second generation. <laughs> yeah. And they're the lame guys. Uh-huh. We've all seen that meme on the Facebook page, the the... The Virgin Golden Age Pirate and the Chad Buccaneer. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> but uh, speaking of Adepticon, do we have any upcoming announcements that uh, we want to we want to go through? Yeah, Adepticon's coming up. It's going to be a big event for Blood and Plunder, and we get the privilege, honor, labor of <laughs> putting on a lot of the events there. We're running. The, uh, all the events for Blood and Plunder and uh, working on Oak and Iron events too. Uh, should be a really good time. What are the dates for Adepticon again? 
It is March 20th through the 24th. And I think we have 10 official Blood and Plunder events uh, scheduled. And I'm looking at the registration right now, and some of them are pretty well full up. We're doing three historical narrative events. Do you want to talk about those, Garrett? So yeah, we're doing a sea, a land, and a amphibious. So the amphibious is going to be a historical scenario based on the 1706 Spanish attack on Charlestown. Uh, so it should be it should be pretty fun. It's not your typical amphibious game. It's going to have like a land element and a sea element going on at the same time where you can kind of cross cross between if you want to and kind of allocate forces to the seaside and, or allocate forces to the land side. Yeah, I haven't got to play test this yet, but you have, right? Yeah, I played it with my group a couple of months ago and it it was it was neat. One person is going to have boats that they can send part of their force to land or part of their force and go kind of reinforce the ship. And and I was playing on the French and Spanish side. So that that's a decision you have to make sort of early on is like, okay, can my land forces hold out and and hold the line on the land side and, and how much can I actually put onto the ship to help my ship commander out in his fight. So it's the balancing act looks like mm -hmm. that's really, really cool. We did something similar years ago where we had the stone tower fort scenario going, but then we had four people playing. So we figured out a point cost to put just a galleon in the harbor that didn't have that couldn't move. So we reduced the point cost significantly and said, all right, if you want to man guns, man it up. And so we had a land force attacking the fort. And then we had a sloop coming in to try and take the docked galleon. And that's exactly what happened was they had to coordinate and say, all right, who's going to be on the ship? Who's going to be on land? And it was happening simultaneously in the same game, the same activation. That's really cool. <laughs> and these are six player kind of epic multiplayer, uh, is that what we call it? I forget, uh, army scale multiplayer. Army whatever. scale, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a lot, of, lot, lot of fun, really easy to jump in. If you haven't played a lot, you can kind of get coaching from your uh, general of your force. Um, so this is a really good event to jump in if you haven't played a lot or want to get some experience, and it'll be a nice big four by six table, uh, look a little pretty. So we got that uh, Charlestown one. We got a Panama scenario for land i think you you've been focused on that one a little bit more yeah we got henry morgan attacking panama this is kind of a stand-up fight against the, uh, the the buccaneers the brethren of the coast basically versus the uh, spanish um just kind of across a flat field you got a hill you can fight over to give you uh, some advantage on the spanish right flank should be pretty fun see if the spanish run away like they really did or if they can hold firm for the six player game and then the C scenario, I believe, is just a pirate versus British Royal Navy. It's based on Charles Vane escaping Nassau. Uh, a little bit of a what if scenario on that, because the what actually happened didn't didn't have much fighting going on, so we had to we had to spruce it up a little bit. Yeah, we've got a fire ship in this scenario. It should be fun. We got like two two British frigates blockading the harbor. Charles Vane sent his big brigantine against the blockade as a fire ship, and they kind of scattered, and he was able to get away. But in this scenario, that fire ship will be heading at the anchored British, so they have to scurry to uh, let get their sail up so they can maneuver and get away from that. And then the pirates can kind of attack at the same time. Should be just a real fun sea battle. Two versus three ships with the fire ship as a wild card in there. I play tested this one a couple times now. It's a lot of fun. I had this fire ship book. I paid a lot of money for. I still need to read to make sure we got the rules right for it. But. <laughs> yeah, I want to play test this one. I didn't get a chance to last month. Hopefully, I can play test it this month. But so, if you're listening to this in February, there might be a couple tickets left. Looks like there's two tickets left for the Charles Vane. Uh, Charlestown is filled up, and there's one ticket left for Panama. Are you going to play with these, Dan? Um, if there's a spot open, I this is my first big miniature con ever. I'm going by train, going on a little solo adventure. So going going there, and I'm playing in the C tournament mainly, but I'm also going there to help out wherever I am needed. I'm playing in the C tournament. I'll be participating in the Blood and Valor tournament. 
I was told that my PDF for the Russo-Japanese War will be dropping before Adepticon, so it will be a legal force. So now I'm figuring out whether I need want to play the Russians from the End of Empires book, or if I want to bring my own force that I designed. But yeah, this is my first big con, so I am I'm very excited. Never done this before. You're gonna play the tournament. We got two tournaments. We got the land tournament, 150 points. And we got the sea tournament at 200 points. These are kind of standard levels at this point for blood and plunder tournaments. Still plenty of room in these. I see 22 registered for the land tournament, and we have a max of 40. So there's still space there if you're interested. 20 of 40 registered for the sea tournament. Last year we had about 20 players in a sea tournament, and this year we have two tournaments. Always fun to see what people bring. And yeah, I'll yeah. be in the sea tournament. I don't do land. It is a meme and truth that I am absolutely terrible on land and blood and plunder, unless I'm hiding in a fort. <laughs> That's the best way to survive. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm hiding in a palisade fort, I'm, I'm good. If you put me outside the walls, I, I crumble. We got open play events too, and you can find descriptions and kind of suggestions for uh, what you might want to bring to these events as far as lists, especially for the historicals, if you want to kind of represent um, what was actually used on our blog, bloodandpigment.com. There's a menu tab for Adepticon. There's a page with uh, all the events, and then there's individual pages for these historical and the tournament events. There's open play events. Uh, the, all these events are thursday friday and saturday 21st to 24th so if you are interested in blend plunder this is going to be the con to go to really the most events of any con all year and highly recommend you come it's in chicago in march and you'll get to meet us actually i'll get to meet you well we have <laughs> the whole <laughs> blood and pigment team has never been together but guy is coming and i'll be there and dan will be there and garrett will be there and jason will be there the whole crew is going to be there and uh, it should be really fun to hang out and play some games and facilitate a bunch of games and meet a bunch of players. Really looking forward to the event this year. Yeah. Have you guys never met in person? I've never nope. met Dan in person. <laughs> he lives far away on the West Coast. I live in Texas. It is not conducive for me saying hi. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've hung out with Garrett more than you, is, <laughs> even though I've known you longer. Yeah, Joseph randomly came to my house. When was that? Last year? July last year. I was in Alabama for a conference, and I had an afternoon off, so I drove up. That was fun. Thanks for having me over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I usually don't go outside, so this is a big deal for me. <laughs> <laughs> it should be fun. I got to touch grass sometimes. Well, in, in March in Chicago, it's going to be cold outside, so I would recommend staying inside when you get up there, too. Hey, I'm, fr I'm from Texas. That's going to be so happy. I cannot wait to be cold. <laughs> I, can, I can do without it. I can do without it. <laughs> There's a reason I live in Georgia. <laughs> For more information about Blood and Plunder, you can go to bloodandpigment.com. And check out all the material we have over there. We have articles on ships, nations, factions, terrain, painting guides, battle reports, anything you can think of. We got faction guides on the Golden Age Pirates and yeah. the Brethren of the Coast. Written by Dan. Yeah. I wrote both of them. <laughs> check out our YouTube channel as well. It's a little slow moving right now, but we got a bunch of videos up there. Uh, looking at all sorts of topics on Blood and Plunder, battle reports and faction reviews and hobby guides. And you can also check out our Patreon if you appreciate our content and enjoy Blood and Plunder and like to see content come out for it. Patreon.com slash Blood and Pigment. And as always, keep your dice ready to win at your pack. Yar-har!